Uh, let's understand something about the structure of the data files that we'll be using for analysis. So a data file looks something like this. You've got a bunch of columns and a bunch of rows. So you've got, in this case, you've got household number, income in thousands of dollars for that household, the lot size of the lot in the, in, on which that house exists, and whether or not the owner of the house also owns a riding mower or not. Okay, I've taken this example from the book by uh, Shmueli and Patel. And uh, this is the typical example of the kind of data file that we'll be using. Okay, so it's just a regular table, nothing complicated. But what I want to introduce is just some terminology here. Okay, so let's look at the terminology. Same data file. Now the columns of a data file are referred to by different names at different points in time. They're all equivalent. So you could say a data file consists of a bunch of attributes, variables, fields, characteristics, features. They're all really saying the same thing. Okay, so household is an attribute, is a variable, is a field, is a characteristic, it's a feature, everything. Okay, so those are just different ways by which columns of a data file are referred to. Uh, and of course, as you can see here, each row of the data file refers to one observation, right? So for example, household number one had an income of $60,000. They have a lot size of 18,400 square feet and they happen to own a riding mower. Household number two, the income was 75,000. They have a lot size of 19,600 square feet, but uh, they, they don't own a lot riding more. Okay, so these are just observations. And for each observation, you have values for each of the columns. Okay, uh, therefore, these are referred to as either rows. So you can talk of row one, or you can talk of object one. So you think of, you, of the, you, you may think that you have got information about many objects. Sometimes they are also referred to as records, cases, points, observations, everything. Okay, so we could just say row and column or field and row uh, for each of these things, right? So these are all different terms that are used in data mining. The collection of an attribute, collection of attributes describes an object, right? So collection of attributes, which is household number, income, lot size, ownership, uh, that describes a particular object or a case, or a record, or whatever we want to call it. Okay, uh, there's also an important distinction that we try to make between experimental data and observational data. Okay, experimental data is data that is gathered consciously. You set up an experiment, and then you're gathering data based on your how your experiment has been set up. Right? So that's a much more controlled process of gathering data. It's a very controlled process. You've set up everything properly and then you're gathering data. Okay, it's a very controlled kind of settings. As the example shows, you know, the subject has been placed in a certain position, uh, presumably has been given some medication, the subject has been given some initial instructions, and then they're carefully gathering data about the subject. Okay, the second type of data is observational data. That is, you're simply observing something. You have not set up any controls. You have not set up the environment where you're going to gather data. You're just walking out, you're observing something, you're gathering data. Okay? That is observational data, which is data which is gathered more or less opportunistically without strict controls. Now, the reason we point this out is, in data mining, most of the time, we are actually working with observational data, not with experimental data. It could be possible that you're mining experimental data, but very often you've got some data and you're now trying to see, okay, what kind of patterns can I detect in this data, right? In other words, this is an opportunistic process. Up front, you may not have any hypotheses to say, well, this is what I'm looking for. You just say, well, I've got all this data. Let me go in there and see if there are any patterns. Right? So the data might not have been gathered with any specific purpose in mind, unlike in an experimental case where you had a purpose in mind and you're gathering data. Okay? Most of the time in data mining, you're working with observational data. 
Now, the big difference with observational data and experimental data is with the experimental data, you could have controlled the way in which you gather the data in such a way that you can draw some very strong conclusions from that. Right. So you could say as a result of this experiment, I find that A caused B. Right. You you can if the experiment is set up right, you can draw some pretty strong causal conclusions. With observational data, most of the time, you won't be able to gather causal conclusions. You will only say, well, I can see that there's a relation between these two, but I don't know which caused which or whether any of these caused the other or not. Okay, that's the big difference. So, for example, you can see here, I'm just showing some, uh, you know, uh, hypothetical example borrowed from Google Tech Talks as is shown here, right? So, you've got information about the amount of Diet Coke consumed and the weight of people who consumed it okay so let's look at the uh, uh, at the uh, at one plot in which the amount of coke consumed is decreasing uh, uh, rather the weight is decreasing with the amount of diet coke consumed right now suppose you take that graph in which case i'm talking about this particular line the line in which the amount of coke consumed is uh, uh, you know as the amount of coke consumed diet coke consumed increases the weight is actually going down Okay, now what kind of conclusions can you draw from it? Could we say, for example, that it is because people consume Diet Coke that their weight went down? In other words, can you draw a causal conclusion from this? Probably not. We don't know, right? We don't know if the consumption of Diet Coke caused their weight to go down, right? Or is it simply that people with low weights have a tendency to consume Diet Coke? Right. So we really don't know what caused what in this. We cannot make causal inferences unless the experiment was properly set up. Right. So if this was just an observational uh, data with no particular controls, you just gathered some data, then you can't draw any causal conclusions. On the other hand, suppose you consider the other one, other line in which uh, as the amount of Diet Coke consumed increases, you find the weight is increasing. Could you say that consumption of Diet Coke is what caused the weight to increase? Or is it that as people become heavier, they become more conscious of their calorie intake and start consuming Diet Coke instead of Coke, instead of a classic or regular Coke. So we don't know about that. We cannot draw any conclusions unless this was a controlled kind of experiment. Okay. Now, there are many different types of attributes of data. One is qualitative or categorical attributes. And the other is quantitative attributes, right? Quantitative attributes, meaning is pretty clear. We are just saying it's quantitative. It's a number. And it's a number such that the number has some numerical meaning. Whereas qualitative is categorical attributes. For example, gender, male, female. Okay, so it's just categories. Or something is classified into colors, you know, red, green, blue, yellow. Those are just categories. And there's no... Uh, you know, there's no particular numerical value associated with those. But within categorical qualitative uh, attributes, you could have two different types. One is called nominal, in which case they are just names like male and female. There's no ordering between them or red, blue, green, yellow. There's no ordering. It's just colors. Okay. Or it could be ordinal, in which case there is an order. Right. So, for example, if you're talking about sizes, right, you may say small, medium, large. There's an order, even though it's just a qualitative because it's not a number. However, there is an ordering. You know, uh, medium is bigger than small and large is small, bigger than medium. So there is an ordering. So it's not just a name, but there is also an ordering. Right. So qualitative variables or attributes could be nominal, in which case they are just names with no implied ordering or it could be ordinal, in which case there is an ordering as well. Quantitative attributes could be either interval attributes, that is their numbers, but only addition of the numbers makes sense. Addition and subtraction makes sense, but not multiplication and division, right? And multiplication and division makes sense when the attributes are ratio attributes. Okay, another category uh, characteristic of ratio attributes is that there is a well-defined zero 
in a ratio attribute. Right? Zero means it's a zero. That it indicates absence of that attribute. Okay? There are some scales which have zeros, but the zero is not really a zero. For example, temperature, right? Measured in Celsius or Fahrenheit, right? Zero degrees Celsius doesn't mean there's no heat. It's just a point on the scale. Zero degrees Fahrenheit doesn't mean there's no heat. There is still some heat because you can go below zero and it's still heat. Okay, so it's only when you measure temperature in Kelvin that there is an absolute zero. Okay, so temperature measured in Fahrenheit and Celsius is not a ratio scale because it has no absolute zero. Okay, so that's the idea here. The, the division operation doesn't make sense. You can't say that something at 100 degrees Celsius is twice as hot as something in 50, which is uh, 50 degrees Celsius. We cannot make that statement. So those are different types of attributes. Uh, so on the following slide, I've given some examples, uh, questions really, for you to think about. So I would like you to pause the video on the next slide and then try to answer the questions. So pause the video on this slide. For each of the attributes or what I've called variable on this slide, number of cars a person owns, okay? Is that uh, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? You don't have to say discrete or not discrete, uh, okay? So you can just say nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Which scale applies to each of these variables? Forget the discrete column, I shouldn't have put it there. Here are my explanations for each of them. I hope you had a shot at it and you can now compare your answers with mine. Number of cars a person owns, well, it's ratio because it makes sense for us to say that someone owns twice as many cars as somebody else. Multiplication and division operations make sense. And of course, if somebody owns zero cars, they own no cars. So there is a meaningful zero in this and therefore this represents a ratio scale. A person's height in inches, same thing, also ratio scales, right? Because you could say somebody is 10% shorter, 10% taller, multiplication, division makes sense. And a scale of zero is precisely defined. It's not an arbitrary point on this particular scale for this particular example. Size of coffee are, are ordered. This is ordinal, right? Because the sizes are, you know, just names. They are not numbers like small, vente, large, etc. But there's an order and therefore you would call this as an ordinal scaled attribute. Price of an item, again ratio as already described for height and the number of cars. Zip code, this is a tricky example because zip codes look like numbers but they're not really numeric because the number doesn't have any real properties of a real number. It's not a number multiplying a zip code by two or dividing it by two or adding 10 to a zip code. Those are not meaningful operations. So it's a number, but the number is just a name, right? So it's it's not really in that sense, a number. It's not truly, it doesn't have the properties of a number. So this is really just a nominal scale. Each zip code is just a name. It just so happens that they've used a number to give a name. It's like you named your child 25, just that, okay? Temperature, this I've already explained, that when you measure temperature in Fahrenheit and Celsius, uh, it's only an interval scale because only addition makes sense. But multiplication and division don't make sense and also it doesn't have an absolute zero. So it's only temperature measured in Kelvin, that's a ratio scale, otherwise it's just an interval scale. Okay, so with that basic introduction, I want to move our attention now to our first hands-on activity. And this hands-on activity, uh, I would just want to kick off the class with an activity that's really useful and it's, it uses pivot tables in Excel. Pivot table is a very powerful feature of Excel that can use, that can help us a lot in getting a handle uh, on the data, on the structure of data. It's very useful for preparing good reports from really large data sets. You can prepare reports very, very quickly. 
So Excel pivot table is an excellent business intelligence tool to start off with. Of course, pivot table is not really one of the techniques that we'll be learning for data mining. Nevertheless, I think it's a good idea for anybody who's looking at business intelligence to really be able to use pivot tables properly. For some strange reason, I'm finding that even people who use Excel a lot somehow are not aware of pivot tables. So I wanted to take this opportunity to make you aware of pivot tables. I've created two hands-on activities in pivot tables and uh, your instructions on Blackboard will tell you exactly what to do with them. So I'd like you to take a look at these two activities, complete them. And of course, I have a fairly substantial assignment based on pivot table as well. And that will be the assignment for the first week. In addition, of course, I've also got uh, instructions for you to install the course software on your computers. I have different instructions for uh, Macs and for Windows. So please take a look at those uh, the document that I've given and install the software as directed for your platform. Now for the pivot table hands-on assignments, unfortunately, I've given you only Windows instructions and pivot tables on Mac are quite a bit different. But I think using my instructions, you should be able to figure out how to create pivot tables on the Mac. Okay, so you'll be doing the hands-on activity uh, activities one and two on pivot tables.